when attempting to understand problems rooted in a large and complex system, you can learn a lot by first identifying patterns evident in smaller, more manageable subsets of the problem. If your observations and analyses are solid, these patterns can then lead to accurate predictions with useful application to the whole. As systems go, you'd have a hard time finding one larger and more complex than the American system of finance, which, as you may have noticed, is in the process of collapsing. At this point, the most urgent question is, how much worse is this economic collapse going to get? As you might imagine, that question is hard to address from way up here, but we might just find some hints if we begin by zooming in and looking way down here, which is exactly what we're going to do. We'll start with Sedona Corporation, a Pennsylvania-based software developer which, in 1999, was one of many publicly traded high-tech firms looking to exchange stock for financing. Then came along a hedge fund called Rhino Advisors and Thomas Badian, its president. Badian introduced Sedona to Amro International, a shadowy offshore investment fund registered in Panama and headquartered in Switzerland. Quite a combination. Amro offered Sedona $3 million in debt that could be converted to stock. If shares of Sedona increased in value, Amro would get fewer shares. If Sedona fell, Amro would get more shares, meaning it was in Amro's interest to see Sedona's stock fall. And fall it did, often as a result of waves of impossibly large amounts of selling that, counterintuitively, could be counted on to follow the announcement of good news. This went on for a while, and Sedona's share price was reduced to pennies. Now, it didn't take long before Sedona, like so many other small public companies in the same position, finally cracked the code. The market wasn't determining a share price. Instead, Sedona was being manipulated down through an illegal practice known as naked short selling by somebody who stood to gain from the drop. Armed with evidence of illegal manipulation, just like so many other small public companies before and since, Sedona went to the Securities and Exchange Commission for help. Normally, things would have ended there. You see, the SEC is notoriously indifferent to complaints of illegal naked shorting. In fact, an internal investigation recently revealed that of 5,000 complaints of naked shorting received in the 18 months beginning January 1, 2007, not one resulted in any action. Not one. The reason for the SEC's indifference is that only big Wall Street players even have the ability to naked short. And as it happens, SEC staffers dream of jumping ship to work for big Wall Street players, not small public companies. This creates a certain disincentive to SEC regulators regulating, as doing so would negatively impact their career prospects. This revolving door dynamic is reinforced in the minds of SEC staffers when their former co-workers do what they were hired to do, which is call in, usually from their posh Wall Street offices, lobbying to make inconvenient SEC investigations into their employers go away. But here's where Sedona's story diverges from the norm and, ultimately, the only reason I'm even telling you about it now. The SEC actually did investigate the illegal naked shorting of Sedona. So what made Sedona special? Well, this might be the one case in which the SEC's revolving door managed to swing in the company's favor. That's because a retired member of Sedona's board of directors is a former SEC commissioner, and he personally lobbied the regulator to look into the case, which it did. And now I'm going to tell you what the SEC found when it did. Now, remember Amro, the shadowy offshore investment fund that lent Sedona $3 million under terms that became more attractive as Sedona's shares dropped in value? Well, anticipating Amro might be tempted to apply downward pressure on its stock, Sedona stipulated in the loan agreement that Amro was specifically prohibited from selling shares of Sedona short. And in the strictest sense, Amro kept its side of the bargain. You see, instead of shorting Sedona stock itself, Amro paid Thomas Badian's hedge fund, Rhino Advisors, to do it for them. Badian, as you'll recall, is the guy who brokered the deal between Sedona and Amro in the first place. Rhino's task was a simple one, do whatever necessary to manipulate Sedona's share price down as much as possible. There are many ways to accomplish that, all of them happen to be illegal, but one method turns out to be particularly attractive, simple and, thanks to a co-opted SEC, almost entirely risk-free, naked short selling. Just as Sedona suspected, this was the tactic that was being used against it. Now here's how it worked. Beginning in March of 2001, Rhino Advisors instructed stock brokerage Refco to sell millions and millions of Sedona shares, which Refco did. 
The only problem is, Rhino did not own any shares of Sedona. Unknown to those who bought them, Refco was not selling real shares of Sedona at all, but share entitlements, which are like IOUs that can be bought or sold as though they were the real thing. That would have been legal had Rhino managed to come up with a corresponding number of actual shares to deliver the buyers within three days, but Rhino had no intention of doing so. As the SEC's investigation determined, Badian and Rhino failed to deliver these shares to the accounts where the sales occurred. As a result, Rhino's short sales increased the supply of Sedona shares in the market and depressed the price. As Rhino did this, Refco went to great lengths to hide what was really happening, and because its sales were not reported or printed to the NASDAQ tape, the short sales were not reported to the market. Well, caught red-handed by the SEC, Rhino closed up shop and Thomas Badian fled the country. This is the essence of naked short selling, and it's how rogue hedge funds like Rhino Advisors have managed to kill or severely damage hundreds upon hundreds of small public companies. All the while, the accounting works like this. Rhino owes the real shares to Refco, and Refco owes them to the people who unknowingly bought IOUs. And because these fails can persist for weeks, months, or even years, it's possible for a brokerage that engages in naked short selling, like Refco, to amass a substantial liability in the form of shares they've sold but not yet purchased. Furthermore, because such a liability would be evidence of the brokerage engaging in illegal activity, it would need to be kept hidden. Now, here's where things get really interesting. As it turns out, Refco did indeed spend years dealing with what, by 2005, had grown into a half billion dollar liability disguised to look like an asset by temporarily passing it off to a company controlled by Refco CEO just before the end of every quarter. That went on for years, until the third quarter of 2005 when somebody forgot to make the swap and Refco's auditors spotted the liability. Within days of the liability's disclosure, Refco declared bankruptcy. And what about Refco's half billion dollar liability? What was that? Well, we may never know, because like a radioactive waste spill, the courts rushed in to seal information about it and everything related to it, claiming that to do otherwise would cause irreparable harm. Of course, normally bankruptcies, no matter how sorted, are handled in the public, but not Refco's. This was very strange. But before all the hazmat teams arrived to seal the area off, a few clues about Refco's mysterious radioactive liability managed to leak out. In one early report, an anonymous Refco insider said the receivables were from a long-standing hedge fund client of the firm. And a source familiar with the investigation said the receivables probably came from short sale positions made from a shuttered hedge fund. Here's another clue. In late October 2005, red flags began to fly when creditors noticed that in a disclosure filed a few months before Refco's implosion, the company listed among its liabilities over $10 billion of securities sold not yet purchased at market or fair value. As the Financial Times reported, typically such a notation is used to describe stock that is sold short, but the investigators have been unable to find which shares, if any, were involved. As a result, investigators working on behalf of Refco creditors are examining whether the bankrupt commodities trading firm engaged in more than $10 billion worth of naked shorting. Here's another clue. A few pages down in that same document, Refco disclosed that even though Rhino was long gone, the years-old SEC investigation into the attack on Sedona had expanded substantially with respect to Refco's role. In this key portion, relating to Santo Maggio, who was head of Refco's broker-dealer operation and someone who is certain to have known about any naked shorting going on, we read this disclosure. Maggio has been in negotiations with the SEC staff and likewise is near a resolution of certain supervisory matters raised in the investigation. Now, the significance of Maggio's role is greatly reinforced in 2007 when the SEC finally filed a complaint against him, stating Maggio played a significant role in concealing hundreds of millions of dollars of related party receivables. In other words, of concealing this mysterious radioactive liability. Let's review the clues. We know Refco's half-billion-dollar mystery radioactive liability was generated by a long-standing hedge fund client of the firm that had since gone away. Maybe Rhino? We know it was made up of short sale positions presumably left unsettled when that hedge fund closed up shop. Given the amounts involved, it must have been a rather sudden demise. That certainly doesn't rule out Rhino. 
which was a hedge fund, as you'll recall, that was closed unexpectedly precisely because it engaged in illegal naked shorting through Revco. We know the SEC investigation that started before Revco's implosion by examining Santo Maggio's supervisory role in Rhino's naked shorting of Sedona culminated two years later in a complaint accusing Maggio of being instrumental in hiding the mystery radioactive liability. Now that would seem to directly link the liability with Rhino and naked shorting. 